I'm Belva Davis. Welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me on our news panel, Lisa Vorderbruggen, political columnist for the Contra Costa Times on the political news of the week. Mark Calvi, reporter for the San Francisco Business Times on new credit card regulations. And Nanette Asimov, staff writer for the San Francisco Chronicle on efforts to get underrepresented students into higher education. Lisa Vorderbruggen, Meg Whitman uh, was out in uh, Lafayette for the Commonwealth Club this week. How was she received? She was warmly received, if not necessarily wildly received. Um, it was a packed house. There's a lot of interest in the governor's race as we get closer and closer to the June election. And of course, you can't turn on the radio without hearing a Meg Whitman ad these days and, or an anti-Meg Whitman campaign now that we've been hearing a lot of those ads as well. Mm -hmm. and, and television. She's also and, and on television too as well. So, well, she's yeah. pretty well controlling her own message because my understanding is she's not granting interviews to reporters. What is this strategy of ignoring reporters? Well, you know, it's an interesting one because, you know, at the Commonwealth Club in Lafayette, um, she granted three very short interviews prior to the event. Uh, Associated Press got a whole five minutes. Whoopee. You know, the rest of us were left standing in the back of the room, you know, against the wall as we're often corralled in the mainstream media and these events um, and given no access to her um, at all. So, which is sort of an odd thing for someone running for governor is, you know, coming in. I, but, you know, we're going to see if it works. She obviously has a lot of high paid consultants and handlers who feel that if they can somehow control the message and keep her from saying something that gets out of control in the media cycle, um, then she's going to be better off. I, I guess we're going to see. Do they risk voter fatigue having her face on television so often and all these political ads we're seeing? Well, so far, you know, you would think we voters in California would be plenty fatigued. You know, we've had so many elections in such a short time. But really, I think the idea is, you know, at the advertising mantra is that how many repetitions does it take before you remember something, something like 72 or some number? I don't remember what it is. Um, and that's really what they're doing is they're just trying to reinforce these very warm, fuzzy, good feelings about Meg Whitman as this businesswoman who can come in and fix the state. What, what about the questions the Commonwealth Club is known for questions from its audience. So were there any hard-hitting questions coming from there or with the moderator, or was there one? <laughs> there, there was a moderator, um, but um, it was a pretty warm and friendly moderator, and there were really no hard-hitting questions, you know, from the audience at all. Um, you know, the, the cards get submitted, of course, and there's a short time period, and, then, and the and she big and gave him a presentation before the question started. So we didn't really hear anything new, you well, know, out of her. because she's not running against anybody, is she? <laughs> well, she's ostensibly running against Jerry Brown, who has yet not to declare, which he will have to do by March 12th. I'm hearing that he's going to very soon, is what we read on the blog. So we'll see what happens when he set, gets in. She's got to, I'm sorry, but she's got to get through the primary before she gets to Brown. We're going to step right over yeah. her Republican <laughs> opponent. Like well, there is, you know, Steve Poiser is still in the race. Um, you know, her, some of her people have been um, uh, accused of trying to pressure Poisoner to get out, and that appears to be the case. He has actually asked the FBI to step in and investigate, you know, the pressure on him to get out mm. of the race. Mm -hmm. But he has now agreed to two different um, uh, debates between the two of them. So, you know, there's no sign on the surface anyway that he is going to be getting out anytime soon. And what other political maneuvering have we seen this week? You know, I hear Gavin Newsom's filed his statement, and I'm just trying to get my arms around all the... Oh, you need a, you know, you need a big cue card to try to figure it all out. Um, Gavin Newsom, San Francisco mayor, may run for lieutenant governor. He filled some, out some paperwork that would let him do that, so he may be in. Dianne Feinstein is out of the governor's race. She's officially said she's not running for governor. Karen Bass, the Speaker of the Assembly, she is going to run for Congress in uh, Diane Watson's old seat, so she's in. Um, so it's just this constant revolving door, these same old, same names. What would it take for Gavin Newsom to be convinced? He, he, can't, he was out in one of the polls as being the most favored candidate. Did he not quite believe that? Well, uh, interestingly enough, some of the latest indications are that as lieutenant governor, he could be the guy to beat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, there's a, an unknown cast for lieutenant governor at this point on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, we have all the fear, of course, about Abel Maldonado, who was nominated and then unnominated and not confirmed and then re-nominated. So we'll see if he can get enough votes um, to get into the seat, at least for a few months before the election comes up on the Republican side. But. And then what are the chances we're going to see some sort of Massachusetts-style complete turnaround in a state like this, you know, with longtime candidates, Boxer and others? 
Well, you know, Boxer is certainly running, you know, like she's got a tough campaign. There, you know, there's a Republican primary there between Carla Fiorini, Tom Campbell, the former yeah. gubernatorial candidates, shifted over to that race, and then Chuck DeVore, um, who's running, and we're going to see some debates, you know, on that side as well. Certainly, Carly Fiorina has the most money. Um, you know, Tom Campbell has, you know, got a lot of, you know, credibility, but not much money, and Chuck DeVore is, I think, third on the money list there. I I'd call this truly the money year. We've had them before uh, yeah. when people with a lot of wealth came in. Um, track record for people who have a lot of money and come in <laughs> without any political background or experience. Well, as we were talking, Al Checky um, spent $40 million of his, of his own money, which at the time seemed like an un astronomical amount. But Meg Whitman is on track to, and said she's willing to spend $150 million, maybe $200 million. Mm -hmm. And we have three independent expenditure committees who say they're going to raise $20 million apiece to fight Meg Whitman on Brown's side. I mean, I mean the money in, in, in the campaigns now is just... Um, but $20 million doesn't seem like much when you're talking over $100 million. Yeah. So what... Combined, you know, and of course Jerry Brown will raise money him, you know, with his own campaign. So the Democrats are very concerned, obviously, that you know Jerry Brown's not going to be able to raise the kind of money on his own that Meg Whitman's able to pour into her campaign. Steve Poisoner is independently wealthy as well; he's already put in quite a few million dollars. So um, it, it just really seems to be a case where if you don't have millions and millions of dollars at your disposal, in some way or another, it's pretty tough to run for governor in the state of California. Well, we're going to turn now to a reason why we're interested in politicians and who's who's elected and what they stand for, which is going to turn to Mark, Mark Calvi here, because we're going to talk about the Congress and what the Congress has done. Mm. Well, Congress passed some regulations to, to really regulate credit card issuers, and we're now beginning to see what that legislation really means to consumers who were quite upset about the way this business was going. So, Mark, uh, what did Congress pass and what does it mean to us? Well, it was certainly a popular move to rein in the wild, wild west of credit card lending. And one of the key things that kick in on, kicks in on Monday is to limit uh, interest rate hikes on existing balances for, com for customers that remain uh, current on their bills. It bans the popular credit card marketing, giving away water bottles and t-shirts on campuses. You know, students don't need that, that grief of getting in credit card debt that early. And then it also ends other fees like uh, charging more than your credit limit. It waives that. I should say, with everything I'm saying, there's a huge asterisk because there's fine print that you've got to read and there's exceptions. But um, those were some of the benefits we got. Um, I don't think people outside the Beltway were stunned to see banks moved aggressively to raise interest rates, kick in annual fees. Wells Fargo last fall uh, it raised most credit card rates by three percentage points. Uh, we're seeing B of A testing annual fees of $29 to $99. So banks are getting very creative in uh, adhering to the law but uh, instituting additional fees. Is this a kind of a backlash against the consumer because of this law or is this something that they're going to have to stop doing? Or? I think there's a, a, a powerful backlash with the public. They're angry with their bankers. They don't trust their bankers, especially in this credit crunch. They're seeing their uh, rates go through the roof or their credit limits come down. And uh, now they're getting more creative, and I think that's going to uh, spur even more of a backlash. Um, we have banks like Fifth Third Bank in my home state of Ohio charging $19 if you don't use your credit card for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, another issuer is charging a dollar a month if you want to get a paper bill in the mail. So we're seeing these banks get creative. City Bank is charging 29% and then giving you a refund if you stay current. Um, so you really have to read the fine print. Whether you're a troubled borrower or a, an excellent borrower, you've got to read the fine print to see how your credit card terms are changing. So, so what are consumers gonna, gonna do as a reaction to this? I know myself and my husband, we just, we have one credit card and we pay it off and we don't play because it's just so scary to try to look at that horrible disclosure thing that's, you know, in four point <laughs> agate type and understand it even if you could read it. Absolutely. I think you're the part of a, an emerging trend. I think more people are going to stick to one or two credit cards. I think we're going to go back to the past where it was difficult to get a credit card. Uh, Dick Kovacevic, uh, former CEO at Wells Fargo, told uh, in investors that they only gave credit cards to their current customers, which who they know well. And I think you're going to see banks say, who, how well do we know the, cu the customer before we issue a credit card? And from your perspective, we're going to see more people say, I don't need all the grief of having eight or ten credit cards. Let's really narrow down the, the, the number of cards I'm carrying. I think that's what we're going to see. And if a consumer doesn't like the kind of uh, whatever the credit card company is doing, can't they just 
you know, take their business elsewhere. They're free to take their business elsewhere, and sites like uh, Bankrate.com will help you decide where there might be better deals. Um, you could also call your credit card issuer if you wish to maybe try to get a new annual fee waived. Although I, a cautionary note I have in this environment is be careful of calling your issuer for fear they'll cut your limit or yeah. decide you know we, you're riskier than we thought. We're going to up your your. Uh, uh, credit uh, rating, I mean, excuse me, your interest rate. So there's a little bit of a danger in this environment to get on the phone with your banker that they might uh, take some adverse ac action on you. Well, I, I know this was done for the benefit of the, the consumer, but it just seems to me that you're putting a little fear in the heart of consumers by uh, what was intended is good legislation in the Congress. Absolutely, and I think we will see some benefits from these limits on raising interest rates on existing balances, but I'd say Congress's work is not done. Uh, small business owners who use cards much like they do a personal card aren't covered with the legislation. They're already looking to expand the law to cover that, and I think it's these bankers get more creative. I think um, they'll be like a cat and mouse game where maybe there's additional legislation pulled in to address that and there's also a big movement on in Capitol Hill to create a, a national consumer protection agency mm -hmm. to help protect consumers when it comes to financial services. Bankers are fighting that tooth and nail but I think by what we're seeing bankers do it adds more impetus for that type of an organization. If, you, if you're afraid to call your bank because you're afraid they're going to cut your credit limit, who do you call? Is there a 1-800 help me with my credit card number? <laughs> there, I probably is. There are consumer, you know, consumers union, there's groups that will help you, there's lowcreditcards.com, there's a number of sites that will help. I would also suggest talking with your banker, look up at your credit score so you know how you're going to be viewed by a potential uh, uh, when you apply for a credit card, it kind of gives you more information. And I'd, I'd actually talk to your banker, get another credit card before you maybe call your own bank and shut down an account, you're going to have a better chance of getting that card if you really don't need it because you have an account open elsewhere. And when they cut your, uh, your, your rate, uh, that does not have an impact on your credit rating? It certainly does because you have less credit available, so it hits your credit score that way, makes you appear more risky. Um, and then if you call those accounts, it makes you appear more risky. Uh, so it's a, it's a catch-22. <laughs> so they get you coming and going. <laughs> yes, I yes. Mean, you, you, know, you picked up on the theme. The, the, the I'm one thing you have Mark. to have, <laughs> you really will have to have to be literate in order to understand at least where this is supposed to go. Which brings us to our next story with right. Nanette here, and that of course is about an effort to make something called Super Sunday work. What is Super Sunday and why is it important? Well, this is a good news story about higher education. Um, uh, trying to tackle this idea that uh, very, you know, relatively few African American students were applying and enrolling in California State University five years ago. Um, the university paired with uh, African-American churches and because the idea was go out on a Sunday talk up California State University the benefits of college education where where the students you want to come to your university are on Sundays mm -hmm. black churches they call it Super Sunday because it comes right around on the Super Bowl time <laughs> and so um, this effort is this year expanded to more than a hundred churches around California and it's been steadily rising every year and um, what the good news is is that evidently it's working um, and uh, black student enrollment and applications have been soaring at California State Universities. So, so this so. is the way I think uh, interesting too is the uh, uh, CSU presidents of various campuses who are taking part and seem to be enthusiastic about this. Yeah, I, last Sunday, um, and let me just say that it's all throughout February, so this Sunday you can go to any uh, probably Baptist church, black church in San Francisco and um, see uh, CSU presidents, administrators, faculty members um, taking the pulpit and preaching the benefits of higher ed. So I was uh, last Sunday at a Baptist Church in Oakland where um, Cal State East Bay President Mo Kayumi uh, took the pulpit and talked up, you know, and, and the, the whole idea is to get middle school families understanding that that's when you start preparing for college. So a lot of these children's parents have not been to college. So it's it's not so you know a lot of people don't understand this complicated procedure of when you have to start preparing what classes the sequence that you have to take and then once you are ready what you do with it how you pay and all so there's a lot to learn and that's what um, is the message from the pulpit. 
So is there, is there any measurement to what, how this is working? Is, is it working? Well, that's, I looked at the um, rate of applications and enrollment of black students before this event started for the first time in 2005 and after. And um, before, yeah, there was a, a rise in the number of um, African American applicants, but it was minimal. There was like a 26% increase in the last, you know, prior five years uh, with applications, but a 78% increase following that. So you got to say, you know, going to where the parents are and talking to them instead of expecting them to come to you seems to be making a difference. And there's uh, some program for students this weekend. At, yes. Uh, is, uh, Cal State East um, Bay. This is uh, part of a larger effort, it's not just the Super Sunday. So this Saturday at Cal State East Bay in Hayward um, is a workshop, a real hands-on workshop to teach parents what you need to do to get your kids ready for college and to pr proceed with this. So everybody go out there at 8 a.m. Um, at Cal State you know, East Bay. This is such an admirable effort, but I understand CSU is turning away students currently. So I'm wondering, how does this dovetail when these students come to knocking on their door in five or six years? Uh, it's such a great question because everybody knows that um, Cal State East Bay is, I mean, Cal State University is having money trouble and they're shaving tens of thousands of students. So it's what, what Chancellor Reed told me is that it's not a question of reducing, but it's a question of getting more students prepared so that they can at least try. Well, a really good news story, and my, my thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight.